Hi guys. Um, it's day 29. I wanted to record this lecture because I think it's going to be kind of a long one and I want to be sure that you guys aren't waiting on me to deliver the information. You guys can kind of go at your pace for this PowerPoint. Um, in order for us to stay kind of like on track, make sure that we finish on schedule. Um, normally I teach this lesson. This lesson is on parasites. Normally I teach this lesson in like two to three days. So having to combine it all into one day, I thought it would be easier if I just go ahead and record it and give it to you guys um, so that you have it. You'll need to obviously work on warm up 29. Um, and then before I get started into the lesson, I wanted to show you guys the assignment. Um, it's a spreadsheet kind of deal. I call it a note sheet. Um, as we go through different parasites, we've got internal parasites and external parasites. So make sure you note that there's two pages to this assignment. Um, I definitely recommend if you wanna work on this as I go through the PowerPoint, this is part of the reason I'm recording it. Um, that will probably, it'll save you, it'll save you some time. Um, so you can use the lesson as I'm going through and fill out each part of the table for both pages. So when I go over Ascrids, roundworm specifically, you'll tell me the location, meaning where does this animal live or attach itself? Tell me the length, how long do they grow to? Some roundworm or some internal parasites are like 14 inches, some are like two. Um, so how long can they grow? What is their diet? Meaning it's a parasite, of course, it's taking, it's taking something from the host, but what is it taking? Some parasites take blood, some parasites take nutrients, some parasites literally eat the skin of the animal. So what is it eating? Does it only affect a specific animal? Um, does it only live on a certain animal or does it just not care? It'll take any animal it can get. What is its transmission method? Meaning how is it spread? Internal parasites for the most part are spread in the same way. Um, not all of them though, and transmission method for external parasites is, is a little bit different. Um, any physical characteristics? Does it have a certain shape to it? What, is it, what does it look like? Um, any kind of physical characteristics about it that you could note? And then any special notes? Um, is there anything special about this parasite? Is it really difficult to get rid of? Can it lead to a disease? Like anything special about this parasite? And then find a picture on Google and paste a picture into this. You'll do it for internal parasites and for external parasites. So without further ado, let's go on ahead and knock this out, y'all. Um, so starting out with internal parasites, um, starting out with some common things with internal parasites. Um, Symptoms. Any animal with internal parasites can be asymptomatic, meaning you don't you don't necessarily know. Sometimes you will see the symptoms. Um, the symptoms they're they're pretty obvious. Um, you're gonna if it's a young animal like a puppy, you're gonna see slow growth because a parasite it's literally stealing. It's taking from the host, which is gonna affect the young animal's growth. You can see a poor hair coat. Maybe their hair isn't shiny. Maybe their hair isn't growing. Um, main thing is you're going to see a pot-bellied appearance, meaning it looks like this baby has a beer gut. This, this puppy or this even this adult animal has like a beer gut where they're skinny, 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 and then their belly, they got a big old belly. This is like a key sign that they have an internal parasite. Um, you can see diarrhea. When you look at their poop, sometimes you can see the, either the entire parasite, like this is a roundworm right here, or you might see eggs, which is right above, or I guess I'm kind of circling it with my cursor. You can see a little egg. Um, young an animals can actually die from internal parasites. It, it takes a lot because they literally have to steal enough nutrients to literally deprive the host to the point that its body cannot continue but they can end up dying. Um, the way you prevent internal parasites, make sure there's no poop lying around because internal parasites, for the most part, 
are spread via poop. They spread via poop, the poop decomposes, there's eggs in the poop, and the poop almost acts like a fertilizer. What grows with fertilizer? Plants. What do animals eat when their stomach doesn't feel great? Grass. So when your dog goes and poops outside, if it has worms, it has eggs, those eggs are gonna go in the poop, the poop is gonna go on the ground, the grass is gonna grow because of the nutrients in the poop, the eggs are gonna stick to the grass. And then when the dog isn't feeling good, they're gonna go and eat some grass. And this is literally how animals can get internal parasites for the most part, roundworms, hookworms, tapeworms, so on and so forth. Um, young animals and uh, animals that are expecting babies are typically dewormed before they have, either before they have babies if they're an expecting mother or if they're a young animal, they're gonna be dewormed before they're sent to a new home. Dewormer, it's oral. If it's an internal parasite, it's living in the digestive system. So how do you get rid of it? You give them something that's gonna run through their digestive system. You're gonna give them a liquid that's basically gonna cause the puppy to poop the worms out. This puppy is gonna have some diarrhea. This dog's gonna have some diarrhea because you gotta get rid of the internal parasites, meaning you literally have to flush them out. Um, so treatment is essentially the same thing. If they have worms, deworm them. If you don't want them to have worms, also deworm them. You don't deworm though, unless you think the animal has worms. Because just like antibiotics, parasites develop a resistance to dewormer. So you don't want to deworm, 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 because then you're going to create super internal parasites and they're not going to, they're going to be resistant. So first one up, ascrids, specifically for this one, roundworms. Um, ascrids is kind of like a category of internal parasites of roundworm species. Um, so this time we're going to go with general roundworms. These guys can grow eight inches when they're mature. They live in the internal tissues of the host and they lay dormant until the host becomes pregnant and they infect the developing fetus, so puppies or kittens. This is why when you're, if you're an animal breeder, this is why you deworm the expecting mother before she has the puppy. So that hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but because the roundworms infect the developing fetus, affect the puppies, obviously gonna mainly affect the puppies and it's gonna deprive them of nutrients. They're a, they're young animals, they're growing. They need all the nutrients they can get, which is why it's not good for them to have worms. Um, ground worms, they travel through the organs through, um, and basically to the respiratory system where they just kind of like hang out there. And it's like, you know, when you feel like you got something stuck in your chest and you're like, <clears throat> and you gotta like cough it up. Yeah, that happens with round worms, puppies, feel like they got something stuck in their chest, stuck in their throat. They cough it up, boom, roundworms. It's disgusting. Um, at this point, they're, they're typically gonna be just eggs though. So it's not as gross. And then as puppies do, they eat everything. They don't, they don't discriminate. They'll eat food, they'll eat grass, they'll eat plastic, they'll eat parasites. So. They swallow them, they eat them again. And that is when the roundworms get into the digestive system. They move to the small intestine. This is basically where they live for the most part until they either take the nutrients from the host or they get poop, they poop out the eggs and the life cycle starts again. Um, another type of roundworm is the Toxocara cata, which is just like the scientific name um, for a specific species of ascrids. Um, this specific species only affects cats, which is why cat is in the name. Um, they basically live the same exact way as the roundworms do on the previous slide. 
except they only affect cats. Um, and then rather than infecting the, fe the fetus, the kittens, um, while they're still like inside the mother, typically Toxocara cati infects the kittens from the mother's milk. So Toxocara cati is they live in the small intestine and they can travel to the reproductive system, to the mammary glands where the milk is coming from. Small intestine is basically like a highway of where do you wanna go in the bloodstream to what part of the body? Toxocara cati says, I'm looking for a stop to the mammary glands. All aboard, let's go. Um, so yes, very similar to roundworms that affect puppies, but specifically affecting cats. Um, hookworms, these guys, they drink blood. They're like the little vampires of the internal parasite world um, where they attach themselves to the small intestine. So once again, living in the small intestine. Um, and they cause small spots of bleeding, which if you have enough hookworms in the system, it can lead to a lot of bleeding. Um, they're really small though. Even as adults, they're only about one inch long. So, you know, tiny little guys. Um, and while they're working on sucking the blood, they also attach themselves to a plug of tissue. So when I think of the hookworm, I always think of the Alaskan bullworm off of SpongeBob. That's kind of just like, I don't know why, that's just kind of how I picture them. And they attach themselves to a little plug of tissue and they work on basically sucking the blood out of that. It's like if the Alaskan bullworm and a leech had a very small, tiny baby. Typically hookworms, um, they, don't, they don't really care who they affect. They will affect older dogs, they'll affect puppies, doesn't really matter. Um, but they are most common in dogs. And they're transmitted the same way other internal parasites are transmitted um, by the eggs being defecated out into the environment, the feces erodes, decays, the eggs stick around and grow on the grass and they get ingested. Um, once they're ingested, they can then work on penetrating the skin and entering into the bloodstream so that they can eventually get to the small intestine. So they can, their final destination, small intestine. How they get there is a journey. Next up, we got whipworms. Um, Whipworms get their name because they are broad at one end and narrow at the other. Um, they use the narrow end to attach to the cecum, which if you remember is the tiny little pouch that attaches between the small intestine and the large intestine. Um, so the whipworms, they got, they got a nice little tiny spot that they like to hang out. Um, they're a little bit bigger and the hookworms are about two and a half inches long. And these guys are really difficult to get rid of because their eggs are, they have a very protective shell around the egg that can live in the environment for years, years, just waiting for an animal to come by and eat it. Um, once the eggs are eaten, they can and they'll infect their host like within a month. Tapeworms, we've already kind of talked about tapeworms. Um, they're a very common internal parasite because of how difficult they are to get rid of. If you remember tapeworms, they look like little tiny rice segments all attached. Um, so if you don't get rid of just one segment, that worm is going to regenerate into all of his other little segments. So they're very common because they're so hard to get rid of. Um, usually the largest worms are gonna end up affecting dogs and they can grow to like over one foot, over one foot long, made up of all these tiny little segments. Um, but they're not super picky, they'll affect, in fact, just about any animal they can get. Literally like a flea, 
or a rabbit. Um, they look like little rice pieces, they're flat, they're segmented, and they live in the small intestine, like most internal parasites. Um, they work on stealing nutrients from the host. They are transmitted just like the whipworms and the hookworms are through the feces, get on the ground, feces decays. Yeah, the eggs live on the grass waiting to just get eaten. Um, and they can regenerate, which is why what makes them so difficult to get rid of. And then we got heartworms, which is kind of like the outlier when we talk about internal parasites. Um, heartworms, they're thin. They look like really, really skinny spaghettis. Um, and they can grow even longer than the tapeworm, 14 inches, one whole piece, not little flat segments, one whole piece. And they live in the, you guessed it, the heart. Um, they live in the major artery that carries blood from the heart to the lungs, which you guys know as the pulmonary artery because we went over heart and blood flow. Um, they live there and they really just kind of like clog it up. They live for a good traffic jam. Um, they're transmitted by mosquitoes, which also makes them different. Um, the mosquitoes, obviously, they drink blood. So as they're drinking, the heartworms say, actually, I'm going to skedaddle out of here. The heart, little heartworm larva say, I'm going to get out of here, mosquito. Thanks for the ride. So the mosquito continues drinking the blood, loses the heartworm larva, not super sad about it. And the heartworm larva works on making its way to the heart, which isn't super difficult because it's literally just riding in the blood and all the blood has to go to the heart. So just sit back and relax and eventually you'll be at your stop. Um, within six months, the larva will turn into adults. They'll fully mature. And they can live for, depending on what animal they're in, they can live for seven years in an animal, five to seven years in dogs, or two to three years in cats. Um, they have a very long lifespan. Um, typically, when, you're, when you see an animal with heartworms, you're going to see symptoms that affect their physical ability. Um, if you have a very active dog that suddenly just wants to lay around, doesn't really want to go for a walk, they're very easily like panting and tired. It's not because they're lazy or they're overweight. It could be because they literally have heartworms clogging their heart and their blood, their body cannot pump blood fast enough because there's a traffic jam in the pulmonary artery. Um, these heartworms, they can, they can damage the animal. They can kill the animal. Um, it's a very difficult process. Uh, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, also, you'll see the dog coughing um, because pulmonary artery means the lungs. So your body is also struggling to get air, to get oxygen, to oxygenate the blood. So you might see your dog coughing, um, almost like they're like, <clears throat> like trying to catch their breath. Um, you'll see labored breathing, cardiovascular problems, the best way to not have to worry about heartworms is to get them on a preventative. And that preventative typically has to be given either every month or every six months, depending on what type it is. Um, because if your animal gets heartworms, the treatment is, it can be very, very intensive. Um, the animal no longer allowed to like run around and get excited because what happens when you run around and get excited? Your heart gets going and your blood gets pumping. So your dog has to take it easy. Your dog has to be monitored very closely. They can't really do a whole lot of exercise because what is the pill that's given to treat heartworms literally has arsenic in it. It has poison in it. Not enough poison to necessarily kill the animal, to kill the dog, but enough poison to kill the heartworms. But it's important that the dog doesn't get worked up because if their blood gets pumping and the arsenic in the medication gets pumping, yeah, it can kill the animal. Um, so it's very important to just prevent heartworms so you don't have to treat heartworms.
So that's it for internal parasites. External parasites. First one up, we got the flea. Fleas are brown, tiny little blood sucking insects. Very tiny, move very quickly. Um, they really just kind of like jump everywhere they go. They're a pain in the butt. Um, Fleas develop from eggs to adults in two weeks. So if you ever have fleas, when I was in college, my roommate, my lovely, lovely roommate one year, her cat got fleas and she brought her cat back to the apartment and gave my cat fleas and then refused to believe that it was her cat. So I had to pay $175 for an exterminator to come and fumigate our house for fleas because it was bad. There was a lot of fleas in our house. It was disgusting. And I had to get them to do it not once, but twice because fumigating for fleas doesn't kill the eggs and the eggs can hatch in two weeks. So I had to cough up $350 to fumigate our apartment because her roommate, or because my roommate's cat brought fleas. Um, so they're very, they can be very difficult to get rid of. Um, typically if, you, if your animal has fleas, if you flip them over, you'll see kind of like the groin area where there isn't a whole lot of hair, um, and in the rump area, kind of like around the butt. Um, this is a more like difficult area for the dog to reach. They can't really scratch it. They literally have to physically sit down and try to scratch it. Um, so this is kind of where fleas like to hang out. Um, fleas can go two months without feeding. So they'll just hang around and wait for their next meal. And they're not picky. They'll bite people. I found that out when my roommate or when my apartment was infested with fleas and a flea bit me. They're not picky. It's not just dogs and cats that they will go after. Um, so here you can see like a whole bunch of fleas. Um, you'll see irritation from the animal itching themselves. Um, you'll see them scratching themselves a lot. If it gets bad enough that they scratch so much, they could lose their hair. Um, the best way to prevent it, get flea medicine, wash your pet's bedding frequently. Um, insect, apply insect besides just means flea medicine. Put them on flea medicine. Um, you can treat it the same way, just put some flea medicine on them, but you gotta get them out of the house. Just cause they're off your animal doesn't mean they're out of the house. Um, so you gotta, deep clean everything. Ticks, ugh, they're nasty. Um, ticks are tiny little blood sucking arthropods, basically spiders that like to drink your blood. It's disgusting. Um, there's two families of ticks. You got hard ticks, which have a hard outer shell and soft ticks that when you poke them, they're kind of squishy, which is again, disgusting. Um, the Brown tick and the American dog tick, they can live indoors, they can live outside, they can go six to 18 months without feeding. So just, just hanging around, waiting. Um, those are the two main hard ticks. The main soft tick is the, this should say spiros, um, the spiros ear tick, um, where they live primarily in the ear, you guessed it. Um, and they cause irritation to the outer ear canal. So basically, if you flip your animal's ear up, you're gonna see ticks all around in here. Ugh, I felt gross doing that. Um, ticks can carry diseases, we went over them. Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, they can carry all different kinds of disease. There's a disease that one kind of tick carries that will make you allergic to red meat. All you can eat is chicken and seafood. No more pork, no more beef. So they carry bunches of disease. Um, if your animal has ticks, well, you'll see them because thankfully, unlike fleas, ticks will attach themselves. Um, they can end up causing anemia in severe cases if like your animal is just like overrun with ticks. Um, you'll see red irritated skin where the tick attaches. And like I said, they can carry disease which is nasty. Uh, prevent them by basically just like looking over yourself and looking over your animal. Um, avoid things like leafy debris, like lots of shrubbery because ticks just hang out there waiting to latch onto something. Uh, there's also medicated shampoos for preventing and getting rid of ticks that you can use. 
Um, if you get ticks, you remove them with forceps or tweezers. You don't want to like pull them off with your hand. You don't want to burn them off because some people say that, oh, you should burn them off. No, you probably don't want to do that. Um, when you use forceps or tweezers, you want to make sure you also get them out because ticks can rip in half, especially the soft ticks. Um, they can rip in half and having a dead tick still attached can end up leading to infection. So you want to make sure you get the entire tick off. Lice, ugh, nasty again. Um, animals can get lice. A lot of times you hear about lice in like young children, which is why you don't like share hats or hairbrushes or any of that stuff because you don't want lice. Animals can also get lice. Um, lice, they're tiny, wingless, white to clear insects that bite and suck blood from the host. Um, there's two different kinds, the biting and chewing kind that will normally infest birds and mammals or sucking lice that will attach and suck blood that don't really like birds, they only like mammals. Um, lice are very, very contagious. They can be spread from animal to animal of the same species or through different species. Lice are not picky. Um, with lice, it'll cause, they'll be, they'll be itchy. Um, you'll see them scratching. You can see hair loss from them scratching and rubbing, trying to get the lice off. So proper sanitation is really important. Making sure everything is clean, making sure your animal is clean, making sure that their hair has been brushed. Um, by brushing your animal, you can kind of see because lice looks like little tiny pieces of white to clear dandruff. Um, if your animal has lice, you got to do two treatments, 12 days apart to make sure there aren't any eggs. Um, and you can do this with a, a dip. Um, you can do it with a dust. You can do it with a spray. Um, you may have to shave the animal. Um, sucks to suck. You might just have to shave them. If you can't manage it by keeping their hair brushed and getting it all out, you're going to have to shave them. Mites. Um, mites also, little arachnids, nasty. Um, there's five species that cause a lot of problems. So the first one we got is demodectic mites. Don't really cause a huge problem. Um, severe cases can lead to like hair loss, reddening of the skin. Um, but typically demodectic mites aren't really an issue for animals unless they have like an, a compromised immune system. They just... Unless the animal is immunocompromised, the demodectic mites typically aren't able to get to the level of infestation to really cause a problem. So if your animal has demodectic mites, then they may also have some sort of immune disease. You got two types of sarcoptic mites, which literally burrow into the outer layer of the skin, which is what causes what we see on this dog's back. Um, they're very, they're highly, highly contagious. And these are the mites that cause mange or scabies in dogs. So like if you ever, like this dog right here, the dogs that look really, really sad and pitiful in the videos because their hair's falling out and they don't really even look like an animal or like a dog, it's because they have the mange. And the mange is just their hair falling out because there's literally an insect burrowing into their skin. Um, so you'll see like severe inching, wrinkled skin, hair loss. You can see like crusty sores. Um, best thing you can do, keep the animal clean. Um, don't really try not to let them walk in like grassy or woody areas where they may come into contact with something like that. And don't let them interact with animals that have scabies because scabies are highly contagious. If your animal has it, you just have to bathe them in a special soap weekly. Um, work on letting their hair grow back, work on keeping everything in your house clean so that the mites don't end up getting on that and reinfecting your animal. Um, ear mites live in the ear. They're pretty, they're pretty contagious. They kind of, kind of look like coffee grounds, which is again, really gross to have to say. Um, but they really just kind of like group together into these little brown groups. Um, You've got Chiletlia mites, which really look like dandruff on an animal. They're known as walking dandruff. Um, 
In severe cases, they can cause like scaling of the back where basically the hair falls out and the skin gets dry and crusty, but you'll normally see this, the dandruff part. If your animal has ear mites, you'll see them shaking their head, scratching their ears. You can look in their ears and see what it looks like. If it looks like coffee grounds, yeah. Well, I got ear mites. Um, prevent it by checking their ears regularly, trying to keep their ears clean. You can treat it with ear drops that can be prescribed by your vet. And then we got chiggers. Um, Chiggers, if you, I grew up in the country, meaning walking around outside a lot in shorts as a child, just doing my thing, walking through the woods. And then I come in and I got all these little red dots on me. I'm like, wow, they, they really itch. Like they, they really, really itch. Well, chiggers are tiny, tiny little mites that have this orange to red color and they live on the skin. And the more you scratch, the further they burrow. So the more you scratch at them or your animal scratches at them, the further they get into your skin. So you can't scratch them. You have to stop. Um, your pet may have to get a cone. You'll have to get some kind of medication. Clear nail polish, you gotta suffocate them. It sounds really, really weird, but clear nail polish over them dries up. It's kind of like this nice hard shell. They suffocate, they die you don't have to worry about it anymore. All right, and then the last couple slides, just kind of random information on things that can be poisonous to animals. Um, obviously, insecticides, it was made to kill a bug, meaning if your animal ingests it to a certain amount, it can also kill them. Um, chemicals that contain organophosphates, which is like the primary ingredient in making an insecticide. Um, thing from Insect traps like roach bait or ant traps um, can also kill an animal if they ingest too much of it, which is why it's important that you place them in proper areas. Um, so if you have to apply any kind of pesticides or insecticides, remove your pets from the area, remove all toys, bones, bowls, bedding, all of that stuff. When I had my apartment fumigated, I had to load Simba up in his carrier and you could, no one can be in the apartment for like five hours. So you know what, me and Simba, we drove around Raleigh for like five hours until it was safe for us to go back into our apartment. I had to shove everything literally on the patio. I came back and my couch was on the patio of the third floor because you can't have any of that stuff coming in contact with the chemicals because it's just gonna soak in and it can be a danger, it can be a hazard. Um, keep pets away from the treated areas, make sure they're well ventilated. So like, you know, all the windows were open, the fans were going, all that stuff. If you have fish that you can't really move, remove, then you need to make sure their tank is covered, that their pump is off because the, a pump is literally taking oxygen from the environment and pumping it into the water tank. If you've got chemicals, you got pesticides floating around in the air, they're gonna get caught in the ventilator and they're gonna go around and your fish are gonna breathe them in and can die. Um, make sure you put your baits in locations where your pets can't get them. Um, make sure that if your pet digs them up that, or if they're like buried baits that your pet can't dig them up. Um, if you're putting out stuff for your lawn to make your lawn grow, make sure you're watching your animal for at least 24 hours to make sure they don't decide to go and eat some grass and accidentally eat some fertilizer. Follow the instructions on the pesticide on whatever it is you're applying. That's for your safety, for your animal safety, for everybody's safety. Um, pets can also be poisoned by eating poisoned prey. So if you have a cat, because you have mice that come into your house, well, you better make sure your cat's not catching any mice if you're putting out mouse poison. Because if your cat eats a mouse that got into mouse poison, your cat can become poisoned. Um, it's called secondary or relay poisoning. Plant, a lot of plants can be poisonous. So if you ever decide that you want to get a dog or a cat and you also like plants, make sure you do your research that it's not toxic, that it's not poisonous to your animal. Um, common plants like 
philodendron, um, pothos, um, poinsettia that you always get at Christmas, azalea, flower bulbs, like tulips, because in case your dog decides to try to eat that. Um, all of that can be poisonous or toxic to your animal. So do your research before getting plants. This is why I only have plants that I keep outside because my cats will eat them. And then obviously household chemicals. If it can kill you, it can definitely kill your dog. Um, so keeping household chemicals away from your animal. Rodenticides, if it was made to kill, once again, if it was made to kill an animal, it can also kill your animal. Um, weed killers, same deal. Antifreeze is a really common thing, a really common source of poisoning for animals because it actually, it has this like sugary taste apparently. So the dog gets into it and is like, oh, I found the human snacks. I'm going to keep eating this because it's delicious. And actually they're poisoning themselves because it tastes good and they don't realize it. Um, antifreeze poisoning can look like the animal is drunk and depressed meaning they're not very coordinated and they're kind of lazy. They just want to lay there. So that's it. Sorry, I tried to fly through that as best as I could because I know this is a long lesson. I try to spend three days on it and I only have one. So make sure if you weren't working on this as we were going, that you review this video, you review the PowerPoint to work on it. Good luck guys.